I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here. You hear me, Don? Would you turn it over and we'll see, right? Set it overlay. I don't know why we call it a mouse. It started that way and we never did change it. Well, like of today, uh, you said to somebody, I'm sure that everyone will have his own individual helicopter soon. And, ah, ha, ha, you know. Well, that was the way it was. Computers were so expensive and so big and clumsy. The idea of being able to have one pay attention just to you just was ridiculous. The mouse became a bridge so that there was really this ability to, to get close and personal with, with the computer, to really relate to it and interact to it. And I think that connection only gets closer in the future as mice or other com embedded input devices really become the bridge between your brain and the brain of the computer working together. on a conventional keyboard and the keycaps were brown. The Apple II also had this power indicator. Now it looked like a button but was really just a light. In the top corner of the keyboard there was a reset button and what this did was clear the screen. The most significant redesign to Apple's keyboards came in 2007 when they announced the Apple Aluminum keyboard. This keyboard was much thinner than the old models and came in two variants. There was two wired versions with two USB ports, one with an extended keypad and one without. There was also a wireless version available that lacked the extended keypad and used two AA batteries. This keyboard is incredibly thin and the USB port is actually the thickest component on it. They act like a stand for the keyboard allowing ergonomics. The new aluminum keyboard was also one of the first Apple keyboards to include many function keys including play pause, brightness controls, dashboard, expose, volume controls, and an eject key. What will the future of Apple keyboards bring? Well, I guess only time will tell. James Bolo Lansing, a talented and gifted engineer, unparalleled in history. When he was 25 years old, he founded Lansing Manufacturing, the predecessor to JBL. He established the company during the transition from silent to talkie movies. A large motion picture company requested that Lansing develop loudspeaker systems for their theater sound. He created the world's first dedicated theater loudspeaker system, the Shearer Horn System. The Shearer Horn was highly acclaimed. These masterpiece products helped grow JBL's reputation for delivering unsurpassed sound reproduction. 
In the 70s, JBL studio monitor speakers became the standard, not only in the US, but also in Europe and Japan.